just a bit of background. I was originally trained as a, a human osteologist, looking at particularly bone microstructure. Now I work on a, a welcome-funded uh, ancient DNA project, looking at changes in British human DNA from the Paleolithic all the way, pretty much until uh, the present day. And so my, my experience is with talking to geneticists, hopefully will give me an insight on how so we can maybe resolve some of the um, uh, issues between moulding archaeology and uh, ancient DNA. So ancient DNA has come a long way in the last few years. Uh, we've moved on from these uh, uh, methods like polymerase chain reaction where you are picking out very specific parts of the genome that you're interested in that are informative and uh, can tell you things. The, the, the problems with uh, these techniques of PCR partly is because you're only picking out very small pieces of the genome and partly that um, you can't really control for contamination very well. And I think that that's one of the things that goes to the very root of some conflict between geneticists and, and archaeologists in there. That when gen geneticists first started, there was a bit of disillusionment about what was promised and what was actually delivered um, uh, by geneticists, but also the fact that this there was this problem of contamination. And you know, it led to um, arguments about the fact that geneticists were insisting archaeologists the only way to get around this was to excavate in hazmat suits and, and, and things like that, completely impractical ideas. And I think that that is kind of partly the root of a lot of problems. What you also tend to get is a lot of modern DNA studies that tend to focus on uh, Y chromosomes, so indicative of paternal ancestry and uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA, which is indicative of <coughs> maternal ancestry, and looking at different ratios of these in different countries and inferring relationships between different populations and uh, ancient population change through relationships uh, with those things. But now we're moving on to what's called next generation sequencing. And, um, this basically picks out all of the DNA sequences within a sample, pushes them through a sequencer, and, um, and, and essentially sequences all the DNA within a sample. So what you get, rather than going from these little bits of informative, um, little informative bits of DNA, you get from data from all over the genome, from everywhere, not just maternal, not just microns or everything. So what you get essentially is a sample of that person, all that person's DNA, and, and, and uh, essentially all of their ancestors as well within, within that sample. Um, uh, it's called healed genome. And, it's, and the good thing about this method is that you can now control for contamination, that you can pick out when uh, the DNA is being contaminated because ancient DNA has a very particular pattern of damage that you can detect. So essentially, the problems that we've had with contamination in the past are more or less over with. Most of the samples that we look at these days, modern contamination just isn't an issue. Um, what this means is that we now have, well, me, me. Two big labs, uh, one David Reich in Harvard and um, Eski willis in Copenhagen, have generated whole genome data for hundreds of uh, uh, ancient uh, Europeans from about 40,000 years ago to the present. And from these genomes, they're, they've come up with uh, a kind of a basic narrative of population change throughout uh, prehistory based on the DNA. So I'm going to go through this narrative through the provocative medium of arrows on maps. <laughs> uh, just to try and, just try and start a fight. Um, so, so basically, at the end of the last ice age, what you're left with in Europe is this bottleneck po population that probably uh, living in southern Spain uh, in the refugia there, that spread out um, across the rest of Europe and, and um, uh, of hunter gatherers that uh, go and live there. What happens around 14,500 BC is that you get a genetic change to the people living in Europe that can't be explained by drift, so can't be explained by natural uh, changes in a person's genome over time. So essentially what this means is that a new population has arrived um, and, and contributes to the genome. In this case, it, it, it's a significant contribution. Some people are, are putting the idea that actually it's almost a um, complete replacement of this previous bottleneck ice age population. Uh, then uh, that population, the Mesolithic population, lives in Europe up until the beginning of the Neolithic and the appearance <coughs> of the Neolithic things and practices, and then you get another huge genetic change, um, which seems to originate down the Near East, specific, specifically um, Anatolia. Um, and there's two separate waves, one that goes uh, through the Mediterranean, one that goes up into uh, Central Europe. And what's interesting about uh, this particular wave of migration is that initially there's no signs of any genetic integration between the hunter-gatherers living in Europe and uh, the farmers that are spreading in. But then you get a little bit of integration after, after about 2,000 years well, sorry, about between 500 and 1,000 years, sorry, later, that there is a little bit of a, the hunter-gatherer genome that pops up amongst uh, 
people's ancestry. There, so it, it, what seems to be the case is that these two populations are living in parallel next to one another and then suddenly, for whatever reason, decide to integrate. Then around 4,500 BC, the genetics changes again partic significantly, particularly in northern Europe. It seems to be associated with uh, the appearance of the, uh, partly associated with the appearance of the corded wear culture. Uh, and again, what you have is this significant uh, change where this corded wear, this uh, kind of, the, well, so the genetics of these populations seems to originate around the Black Sea and the Pontic Steppe, so uh, associated with the Yamnaya culture. And um, what you get is that people, after this point, people have a significant amount of Yamnaya ancestry. And then again, you seem to get a um, resurgence of the kind of Neolithic um, signature um, a, few, a few hundred years later. So again, it seems as though there's an aspect to which these two populations are living in parallel and then coalesce. Um, so what this means is that modern uh, population, human populations in Europe can be explained by different proportions of, um, of uh, these, these ancestries. So uh, you can see the main split is between Northern and Southern Europe, that the, uh, Northern Europe is uh, much more dominated by the steppe ancestry. Southern Europe is much more kind of the Neolithic uh, farmer ancestry. Um, and there's not much hunter-gatherer ancestry in um, many of them, but where you do get more is kind of uh, Lithuania, Estonia, up in the Balkans around there. Um, so like, uh, arrows on maps, um, uh, big population changes associated with cultural changes. Are, it, are we uh, sort of sweeping away 30 years of uh, archaeological theory looking at this? Are geneticists just reductive bastards? Uh, that's a simple answer to that. <laughs> but th th this is the point, I think this is the source of a lot of the misunderstanding, is that this is just the way genetic geneticists work, that they are looking at uh, simplest explanations for things, getting to the root. And I think that People, I think what is implicit in a lot of genetic studies is they provide explanations, but the, the implicit assumption is that they are more complex than what they are saying, but they are only providing what, what they think they can say, the very minimum of what they can say, and I, I think that that's part of the method. So the, it's part of, partly to do with the method and partly to do with the questions. So they have questions, they're questions that they want to answer. Um, is there genetic change? Can this, how is this genetic change explained? Is it change, uh, explained by drift or is it explained by admixture with other populations? Does it correlate with, uh, does that explain genetic variation amongst modern populations? Uh, is it associated with changes in culture? And really that last part is a bit, the bit where they come a bit unstuck. But the other questions are almost naive of archaeology. You know, they, they're answering their own questions. They're oblivious to really what, what, what we're looking at. And it comes down to the fact that they are testing essentially uh, using a model-based approach where they have simple models model of either uh, admixture or a continuity of a population and then which one is it more likely to be? It's more likely to be this one, so they say it's an admixture and the population comes along. And they've essentially answered what they want to answer there. Obviously that leaves us wanting more. But the thing is, is um, one thing they've answered what they want to answer, so they have no compulsion to really continue with that. There's also an aspect to which they can only, they can only the, the models, in, so the interpretations can only get any more complex. And in order to uh, make them more complex in a modern approach and they need more prior information and they need that from the archaeological record but they don't understand the archaeological record and they're naive to it um, um, so they, they can't sort of continue so um, in a sense there's almost a, a point where they've reached the limit that they can get to in terms of what they can say I mean it's quite grandstanded stuff but they've reached the limit what they can say without engaging more with the archaeological evidence and producing more complex models that are sourced through the uh, archaeological uh, evidence. And again, so the genetic approach comes back to this age old quote. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some useful. The geneticists know it's wrong. It's a straw man to say that they are um, saying that it's always this simple. It, 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 it's, it's assumed that it's more complex, but they are just putting out what they can actually say. Um, so um, there's, a, there's an aspect to which, yeah, okay. Um, these models are too simple, but there's also something that we need to get to grips with as archaeologists, that there are big cultural changes that are associated with big genetic changes, and there's no way of getting around that, really. That is the one thing that's come out of these, these studies that we, we can't get around, and uh, we're going to have to accept that. Also, just to um, bring it in entanglement, because that was sort of, uh, that was sort of the point, of the, as I understand it, that was sort of the point of what was written into the abstract of the session. So it, it, in the past, what it seems like is that genes and... Um, Genes and particular um, physical uh, traits are more associated 
with culture than, and lifestyle than they are with geography. So we, we think about major genetic variations today associated with, with where, in the, where, where you actually live. But then it was mostly related to culture and, uh, and lifestyle. And the biggest illustration of that is pale skin. So um, the hunt and Mesolithic hunt and gatherers that lived in Europe all seem to have had dark skin. The vast majority seem to have had dark skin. And pale skin doesn't seem to have uh, arrived in Europe uh, in terms of being the predominant phenotype, predominant physical trait in Europe until the Neolithic. And that seems to spread in particularly with farming. So pale skin at the moment is thought, one of the ideas it's thought to be a particular adaptation to farming rather than something, something uh, adaptive to uh, northern, northern Europe particularly. And um, so, but what I would say is that we, we are not returning to the bad old days of, of kind of culture history and migrations and stuff. Because of some of the complexities that have come out of the evidence, come out of the genetics evidence themselves that need, that need to be explained. So you, um, you have this two, two different, uh, gr genetically quite different groups. So genetically, the Neolithic and Mesolithic populations, you know, the genetic difference between them is the equivalent of two people today from two different continents. That how, that's how genetically divergent they are. Um, and the, so the, there's, there's an aspect which is the, uh, of exploring how do, how do you explain these two populations living in parallel in Europe? How do you explain them then merging and what, what is the event or what, what is the social interaction that, that uh, involves them merging together? The way that these two populations merge around, uh, merge around Europe uh, varies. So clearly there's quite regional, very specific interactions going on here that can't be explained by the genetic evidence and that's where the archaeology has to bring in to explain these things. Uh, similarly, in the Bronze uh, in the Bronze Age, when the, with this big uh, step migration, and what what you, what you have there is um, also is um, uh, there's also clearly instances of cultural change that aren't associated with genetic change. So, um, particularly the, the development of the Beaker culture, uh, Bell Beaker culture in Iberia, doesn't seem to all be associated with the arrival of a new genome and the interaction between different cultures in Europe at that time, and genetics is much more, seems to be much more complex. So actually, in a way, these new, um, these new results are really maybe even increasing the need for, th for ar archaeological interpretations, the, the kind of um, application of archaeological evidence, and through that, more, kind of more interpretive frameworks in which to sort of incorporate this um, new data. But I think there's also a question, some questions that we need to ask ourselves about whether we, and I, I don't really know what, the answers to these, whether we and how we manage to talk ourselves out of the idea of cultural change linked to genetic change. And, you know, for a while, it's it, it, um, obviously it, 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 it was seen as um, almost heresy sometimes to, to even utter that kind of uh, relationship. Is it alarming that we have this genetic change in the upper Paleolithic that hasn't really previously been noticed before? And is it also alarming that we have instances of genetically uh, so, po populations that we can pick up genetically, but that we can't, we don't pick up archaeologically. Um, and uh, so, the, there were some questions arising maybe for archaeology about that. So, I think that uh, what comes out of this is that clearly the, the genetic evidence can't really reach its full potential without the archaeology. I mean, it's, 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 it's so information rich; it's hard to it's hard to kind of really articulate just how information rich this uh, uh, genetic, the whole genome genetic evidence we're getting back is. So. Um, there's clearly potential for, to, to, to address a lot of questions using genetic evidence with archaeology. So we've got the questions that I mentioned before about the um, resurgence of, um, of certain genomes at different times in, uh, in prehistory that will only be answered really through exploring the archaeological evidence. But I think also in terms of archaeological theory itself, with um, sort of <laughs> what could be described as well as the lack of imagination from, from geneticists on some extent is that they are interested in these social questions. If we can express it to and, and more complex questions, if we can express it to them where they can understand. So in that sense, you know, it, it, people might think that this is almost a denigration of archaeological theory, but archaeological theory works as a kind of hy hy hypothesis generation. And if you can express, generate some kind of um, testable um, uh, model out of, out of sort of a, your theoretical interpretation, put that against the genetic evidence, then that is, that is the only way that we're going to be able to engage with directly with the, the DNA evidence, because that's the only way you can manage that data, is testing models against that. And it can, they can be quite complex models, because there's so much information there. They can be complex, but I think it's about 
understanding how to express that and communicating with geneticists through that kind of medium. Because in a sense, we're, we have to, we're a little bit enthralled to them because they can understand that data, the raw data, in a way that we can't unless we all sort of retrain as geneticists and computer programmers. Um, and uh, the, the, the biggest illustration of the... To, uh, cheers. Of, of, of uh, a really poor genetic study that, that was poor because it didn't interpret any archaeology was this genetic analysis of the triple burial from Dolny Vestanice, so um, about 26,000, uh, I think, uh, years ago. These two people were buried for a while. This was considered to be the uh, kind of first unambiguously ritual uh, burial in Europe. And a lot, there was a lot of interpretive water under the bridge about the fact that this triple burial was uh, two men on the outside and a woman on the inside. Um, and the fact that they were closely related to one another. So there was a paper that came out this year on um, Ice Age DNA in Europe, and it took away the supplementary information was that they'd, through the genetics, they'd identified the sex of these individuals. All three of them were actually men, and uh, took in the way you could, you could figure out from the mitochondrial haplogroups and the Y uh, haplogroups that they gave that at least two of them are not directly related to one another. So there's so much upset that, that could cause, you know, in terms of the interpretation of this burial, but it never came out. What they actually did, they actually published again the same data in a different paper uh, in PLOS One, and it was such a missed opportunity, there was just literally no archaeology in there. All it said was, yeah, they're all men. It didn't even touch on, on uh, the relationships between them, didn't really bring in what this means for the interpretation of the burial. Literally, they could have just written, they're all men, and then had, you know, to the genetic information. That, that was essentially what it did. It was such, such a missed opportunity to really engage. Because these are the big questions that archaeologists are interested in, is really engage the community in what DNA can do now. You know, these things that seem quite simple to geneticists are actually very important to archaeologists. So conclusions. I, I think that we, we really have to start seeing the genetic evidence now as kind of a scaffold that, that could lay the foundations of, of, of the development of our um, archaeological uh, interpretations, because whether we like it or not, there is big genetic change in Europe at, at different stages of, of prehistory. But the, the simple explanations that the genetics <coughs> provide that we might not like, we, we can help refine those with our, our, our archaeology and uh, with archaeological theory, potentially this hypothesis generation. I don't think either, and the thing is, we, if we don't uh, sort of start make, taking note of these new studies, we will miss the danger of just completely misunderstanding the archaeological record. If if, if we just ignore the fact that this, there's a lot of it, there's good evidence that there's a population change at particular points in prehistory, then you know that is going to have an effect on the archaeological record somehow, whether that's big or small. So we, you know, we we can't sort of put our head in the sands about this. We're going to have to start incorporating this. And but then at the same time, DNA can only say very general things until it is combined with the archaeological evidence. Um,